seventh installment in the long-running Mission Impossible franchise has dropped in theaters. So today we're going to stop and rank all seven Mission Impossible films from the least best to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all seven Mission Impossible films. My list is the right list. It's just my list and I would love to hear yours. One of the interesting things about this franchise is that by now, it is entirely associated with Tom Cruise. It is his action spy franchise with one of the best track records out there. But back in 1996, it was the adaptation of the 1960s TV show, Mission Impossible. And that entire history of the television show and all of its influence has kind of been replaced by these daredevil stunt Tom Cruise movies that we've been getting. But it started as a TV show 60 years ago. And even at the time that the first movie came out, this was already a 30 year old franchise. So little piece of history if you didn't know any of that, and let's get started. Coming in in last place, Mission Impossible 2. And while this is easily the weakest Mission Impossible film, and it absolutely does have some very clear issues, if this is the worst movie in your franchise, you're doing pretty good. It's not that bad, and it has some great and very cool elements to it. But it feels like they had three different movies that they were trying to make here. It's one part James Bond-esque womanizing spy thriller. It's one part Mission Impossible movie and one part John Woo film. And the three parts definitely don't seamlessly go together. It feels very clunky, like we're switching between which type of movie we want to be. And the story and script are structured in such a way that it's incredibly backloaded with all of the action. So it kicks off in the first 30 minutes. It's very much about this romance between these two characters. And then it kind of goes into the Mission Impossible type stuff of sneaking around and espionage. But it feels like it's meandering. And then at like the hour mark, it just like kicks into high gear and it's all action sequences for the next hour of the film. So it's very oddly paced from very slow to incredibly fast paced at the back end of the film. And when it's the romance spy womanizing stuff, I just don't think it really works. It doesn't fit in this franchise, it doesn't fit with anything else we've seen about Ethan Hunt. And it, it just takes too long to get going. But once it kicks into high gear, John Woo shows up. John Woo directed this film. I was a massive fan of his Hong Kong work with Chow Yun-Fat, The Killer Hard Boiled, A Better Tomorrow, prior to seeing this film. So I was very excited to see what he was going to do with the movie. And the first hour of the movie, very much disappointed in that regard. And the back half, very much delivered in that regard, where you get his highly stylized, choreographed gunfights with the slow-mo, the doves, cool action hero shots, using motorcycles as shields, all of it, very cool action shots in here. They don't really fit with the rest of the franchise because John Woo has such a distinct style, but in and of themselves, they are very cool action sequences. So for me, this is a movie that always kind of had issues with pacing. It does deliver some very cool action in the back half of the film. Easily the weakest movie of the franchise, but if this is your low bar, a movie that is, is oddly structured and oddly paced, but has cool action at the end, you're, you're doing really good. Of course, the other thing you have to give this movie credit for is Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. The villain of this film, Dougary Scott, was cast to play Logan in the first X-Men film. And then whether for reshoots or they went over schedule, he had to drop out last minute because of this movie. And so they got this nobody Hugh Jackman to step in to play Wolverine, and of course, the rest is history. Number six, Mission Impossible 3. To be totally clear, there's a big jump between Mission Impossible 2 and Mission Impossible 3. This is like a B-plus movie for me. That's how much I enjoy these movies and how consistent I think they are. Mission Impossible 2 is the only kind of dud in there, and it's still entirely watchable and has some great stuff in it. And I think that Mission Impossible 3 is a very good movie. When it comes to this film, I think it makes a lot more sense if you've seen the TV show Alias. 
See, J.J. Abrams ran the show Alias, and he met Tom Cruise somewhere, and he handed him a DVD set for the show Alias. Tom Cruise went home and watched it, and he went, that's what I want for the next Mission Impossible film. He hires J.J. Abrams to make the film, and... Mission Impossible 3 is basically Alias the movie, except it stars Tom Cruise. All the stuff about Ethan's personal life, the fact that it starts off with the end of the film at the beginning. There's a J.J. Abrams mystery box about the the um, Grabbit's foot that they're tracking down that never really gets answered. It's like overtly stated in the movie that they don't really answer what it is. All of that, it's Alias. And so this movie in that context, it makes more sense in that context than it does in the context of the rest of the Mission Impossible films. But I, I mean, I think it's just this movie brought us really into the modern era and style of Mission Impossible films in a lot of ways with Bad Robot kind of taking over where you have big, gigantic action. The first Mission Impossible movie was very had thrills, but it wasn't an action movie like this with machine guns and explosions. The bridge sequence in particular stands out. When you move into the back half of the film, there's some real nice urgency and momentum. What this movie probably does the best of, of all of our threats that these movies have had, I think this one feels the most personal because it's it's Ethan's wife. It's not necessarily gigantic stakes, it's personal stakes that just makes us more invested in what Ethan is trying to do. And there's a desperation in the cold open scene of what's taking place there that adds an intensity that's different from what you get in the other movies. Philip Seymour Hoffman, one of the best f f villains in this franchise, just so cold, menacing, and just disturbing in the way that he talks to Ethan, the confidence that he has and the threats that he makes just adds this whole other level. With Like with most of these movies, it has a great cast to it. But I would say with all the things that kind of work about it, uh, it doesn't feel like it's quite as effective as maybe it should be. It doesn't have, it has urgency and momentum, but I don't know that it has a, as strong of a rhythm and a flow as some of the films higher up on the list. And it, it doesn't feel like it goes out on a bang it gets very personal when you get to the third act of it, that it, it feels like it should be like a, a action sequence in the middle of the film. It's literally Tom Cruise running and then fighting guys in a room. It doesn't, it's kind of compared to the rest of these films that are just so bombastic and big in the finale. This one feels like it ends on a little bit of a whimper. And so I still think very good movie, very enjoyable, solid entry in the franchise, but... This is a really good franchise. Next up, Mission Impossible 1996, the first one. And as I kind of alluded to over the last two films, this one feels very different from the rest of the franchise because it's not a big action movie. It has action, it has thrills, it is big, but like Ethan Hunt never shoots a gun in this film. And when you consider what the movies turn into later on, that's kind of fascinating. This is a, a true spy thriller that's all about building tension and then having a release and putting characters in these intense situations where you're holding your breath, wondering what's about to happen, paying attention to small little details and conversations as Ethan is floating over a floor, paying attention to a single drop of sweat going down his brow and onto his glasses, that makes you nervous because the film is about truly building tension in even the smallest of little ways. Or a shot where you see someone holding a rope and then you just see a rat walk behind him. A nose itching matters. That sort of edge of your seat thrills rather than big bombastic action and stunt set pieces. And that makes this movie stand out in the context of the franchise. I mean, sure, there's action, there's explosions, there's the train finale, but it's all done differently than what we got before. Also stays a little bit truer to the original TV show in some ways, in particular with the original opening sequence or first Scenes in the film, the cold open, the way they get the messages, the team being assembled, all of those kind of nice little details right there feel true to the original show and make it stand out from what 
the franchise has kind of turned into a little bit. I don't think all of it works, especially on second viewings. There's some details that are a little bit funky, some ideas that it's like, okay, where were you kind of going with this one? But like a nice addition that just knows how to put you on the edge of your seat without needing to get big and gigantic. Now, this franchise is old enough that this movie came out right as I was finishing the eighth grade. And then this new movie comes out. My son is entering the sixth grade. That's how old this franchise is, is that we've got a full generation of Mission Impossible movies. Number four, Rogue Nation. And to be perfectly clear, the top four on this list are all really close. They're all way up there for me. So this movie kicks off the Christopher McQuarrie era of Mission Impossible films. And when it came to the first five movies, they each had a different director. And that was something I actually really appreciated about the franchise is that they kind of have a different flavor based off who directed the films and it changes it up just a little bit. And then this last little run, they've stuck with Christopher McQuarrie. And I was pretty actually put out a video being critical of that at the time. But with his specific skill set that he brings to the table, I think it has kind of worked out. And what one of the things I think that he does that's really good with his films is that he adds this layer of kind of world building and making it this cohesive universe. It doesn't just feel like we have these isolated little spy adventures off somewhere. They feel a part of this bigger world that that's taking place. And they, they start to pull in of events from the first movie and the third movie and kind of flesh things out in a bigger and grander way. And you get this sense of different spy agencies and the United States government and how the IMF functions inside of it and the conflicts that go along with all of that. Love all of that. Of course, other fun thing about this one is that it adds in several great characters into the mix. Of course, Rebecca Ferguson. At the time, I first, this was the first movie I ever saw her in, and she just immediately makes an impression and wows you, and you're like, I don't know who this is, but she's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tom Cruise and absolutely keeping up. She is just fantastic, and she's interesting enough, mysterious enough that you want to learn more about her, but also is, is charming and engages with them. Just great chemistry. One of the things this franchise has done really well is bringing in new characters that go great with Ethan Hunt. And of course, you get big, gigantic stunts. I mean, we kick off with Tom Cruise dangling out of a plane. There's a lot of wit in the way the story is structured with the misdirections, the masks, the cleverness, the traps that they set to get things revealed. You get all that stuff that you want. Reason I decided to put it at number four, different month, different week. It could have been higher. I feel like this one gets a little bit lost in the mix to me, where when I think through the film's and their plots and everything. When I think of these, you know, this one in Rogue Nation and Fallout, Fallout just pops a lot more. And so it's like, which remember what happened in these two films? This one just doesn't stand out with necessarily the moments or the plot, as well as the top three. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know your ranking of all seven of the Mission Impossible films. Also, if you like this type of content, I've done a ton of other uh, rankings of action and spy franchises. So I'll, I'll link to a couple videos up here that tie to some franchises. Like I've done all the James Bond movies. I did a 31 on 31 with 31 iconic action movies. You can check that out somewhere around here when this video is done. In third place, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. For me, this is probably the most fun Mission Impossible film that just adds a levity into the mix that there's just always the right amount of humor taking place throughout the entire film. What makes this movie so good? Well, you have these iconic action sequences, then you have the Kremlin sequence that has all these cool gadgets, which is another thing I love about this movie. It feel like, felt like it had the best gadgets of the entire franchise. So they're using that wall that is able to like create images of what someone's looking at based off where they're at. It's just like a really fun, clever idea that adds tech into the Mission Impossible world and just like fun things like that. And then of course the tower sequence. For me, the tower sequence, I saw this movie for the first time in IMAX. That is the single best 
sequence I have ever seen in a movie theater, the Dubai Tower sequence in IMAX. It's just phenomenal. And every single time I rewatch this movie, even at home, wherever I watch it, it is a perfect sequence. It just knows how to continue to add stakes, conflict, and entertainment value. Everything to make for just a perfect, thrilling sequence that's truly cinematic, worthy of being seen on a gigantic screen. That's what this sequence was for me. One of the things this movie does really well is that it's always do, it does a great job of adding tension on top of tension in every sequence. So you're scaling the tallest building. That's interesting in and of itself, but then they have a sandstorm coming. That's even more interesting than a glove is failing. So he only has one glove and he's having to use his feet. Oh, even more interesting. And there's a ticking clock. There's that part where he has his hand up and he has to kick the glass and you're like, oh, please don't do that. And then he loses that glove and the rope's not long enough. And then he swings in, almost makes it. He's a little bit too high and hits his face. It's stacking conflict. Every time the novelty of he's dangling from a building wears off, it adds one more thing into it. And if I was just evaluating the movies on the first hour, this would probably be my first one because the first hour of this movie is so good. I think it does lose steam in the back half of the film. It never gets bad. It's still good, but the back half isn't nearly as good as the first half. The finale is not nearly as interesting as the tower sequence or the Kremlin sequence. If we're just looking at that first hour, I think you'd have the top Mission Impossible stuff. It is so unbelievably good. It's so fun. It's so entertaining. Our runner up Mission Impossible Fallout and this movie takes everything that was already fantastic about Rogue Nation and just makes it that much better. When it comes to the world building, it feels even more cohesive and tied to the rest of the franchise where you have a character with deep ties to the first Mission Impossible and fleshes out some de details about relationships going on there. It pulls back in Ethan Hunt's former wife into the film in a way that helps us catch up on where she's at and also helps us understand Ethan a little bit better. She's there to be a distraction, to add stakes, to get involved in it. It, but it just kind of pulls it together to make it feel like we really have a franchise of movies that go together. It finds a way to just have this intensity and urgency throughout the entire movie where right out of the gate, you feel the danger and we need to go and try and solve all of this. Some of the conflict comes from what could be a fault of Ethan Hunt, but it's also his biggest strength and asset is his unwillingness to allow his team members to die. And so you just feel like we're really unpacking him, you know, six movies into the franchise. It's great to see Henry Cavill join this series, playing this great antagonist. Even at the beginning where he's working with them, he's clearly an antagonist and not very much on their side and just so good at being this ruthless character that is brutal and fun to see him pairing off, sparring with Tom Cruise. And of course, you just get nonstop, fantastic, memorable action that is treated in a manner to make it as thrilling as and as exciting as possible, where you move into the third act and you just have, once again, that layered conflict of there's bombs, there's helicopter chases, there's fights, there's things collapsing, there's people being hung, just keeps doing things to make it more and more dangerous, more and more intense, and the mission even more impossible. So when you have victory, it's that much more exciting and thrilling and satisfying that they were able to overcome so much and finally be victorious in the end. So I, I really struggled. It, I don't know where I'll be at a year from now when I rewatch all these movies, which one will come out on top. There, there's four movies here that I just think are fantastic. This one might should have been on top. I don't know, but it's fantastic. But for today, coming in at number one, Dead Reckoning Part 
one. And I really spent a lot of time going back and forth on which film I think I needed to put on top. I have seen this movie two times. I loved it the first time. Second time solidified the fact that I just had an absolute blast with this film. Maybe it's recency bias, but I just thought this was a terrific addition to the franchise that what this one did really well is that it feels like it has the world building, this connected world of the previous two Christopher McQuarrie films, but adds in the levity of Ghost Protocol. So it has all the elements of my favorite films in this franchise. Also, it's a movie that's two hours and 40 minutes long, but for me, it just flew by both times that I watched it. It just moves at this incredible pace. And a big part of that is that it's so efficiently crafted and structured in a manner that it just always feels you're in the middle of the action. It's really only kind of five sequences. If the first one is the pre-roll, the pre-credit sequence, which is actually several different sequences, but you have the prologue setting everything up and then you go to the airport, you escape from Rome, you go to the nightclub, and then you go to the train. That's the whole movie right there. But like when you go to the airport, it goes straight, your credits are still rolling and we're going straight in to the mission. There's people trying to catch Hunt and they're at the airport giving directions as to who we're going to meet with and immediately stuff is happening. And then once the airport is done, there's one scene bridging it before we get to Rome. It just moves so quick and immediately we feel like we're in the middle of the next thing. There's not all these different location scene sequences that kind of cut the momentum. You're just always going forward with this film. Of course, more terrific action stunts, all the stuff that you expect. And this is a movie coming out of it in, even with the way they marketed it, where you see that like Tom Cruise is a craftsman when it comes to these movies. So I, you know, obviously I love Marvel movies and comic book movies and all sorts of franchise films, but they tend to have a formula that they stick to and they bring new people in and they go, here's how we make our movies. And so then they, they go through that process and though they, they turn into, you know, the chilies of blockbusters. I love Chili's. I take my kids' family to Chili's all the time. I think it's a very fine restaurant. Their menu, their formula works. But it's not like fresh and original. You know what you're getting at Chili's. Tom Cruise makes these movies as a craftsman. And he goes, what is the insane thing that I can do? What would be most entertaining? What will bring some new life and energy to this franchise? And then he spends a year of his life preparing to do it. He did 500 skydives, jumped out of a plane 500 times to prepare to do one thing in this movie. That's what a craftsman does. The new characters are interesting. Haley Atwell, she's been in Marvel movies for over 10 years now. She shows up in this film and immediately it's like, it feels like it's her breakout role. It has stakes that are big as well as personal. It feels like it has a plot that I'll remember that stands out with the AI stuff. So for me, this is just a top tier, fantastic Mission Impossible film. Granted, I think there are four top tier, fantastic Mission Impossible films, and then two more that are great Mission Impossible films. This is an amazing franchise that is very consistent. But as for today, Dead Reckoning Part 1 comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, I've got more like it. You can check those out right over here, the James Bond film, the Jason Bourne films, as well as the 31 on 31 ranking, 31 different action movie classics. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too.